Hello, Sunday Seminary. Welcome back. We will be looking today uh, at the story of Elijah as he flees from Jezebel and is despondent and uh, uh, goes to Sinai, uh, or Horeb as it's named here, uh, in search of God, in order to ask God why uh, God is allowing this to happen. So we've, we're on the, the, the tail end of uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, and remember that uh, Elijah uh, executes the prophets of Baal uh, to try to get rid of all the bad guys, in his mind at least, uh, and then the drought ends. The several year long drought um, is completed, uh, and Elijah announces this, and then uh, the servant of Elijah, remember, sees the storm coming, and Elijah runs down the mountain past uh, the chariot of, uh, of, of Ahab on his way to uh, uh, to Jezreel. Uh, so Jezreel was this amazingly beautiful valley uh, that was very fertile, and we're going to see that valley come back up in chapter 21 with Naboth's vineyard. Uh, but but here in this story, uh, Ahab, uh, the, the in, in the beginning of chapter 19, uh, the uh, focus turns back to King Ahab. So Ahab tells Jezebel, the queen, Remember, she's a Phoenician queen. Uh, she's uh, a Baal, a dev devotee of Baal, or at least according to the text. Um, uh, and she is, uh, by the way, the, one, one thing I should say about Jezebel is that she's got the kind of uh, reputation in Christian history uh, and in Christian interpretation for being uh, seductress and things like that. That comes from the book of Revelation, which uses the name Jezebel uh, to talk about idolatry and then talks about um, kind of, uh, in, in a way, um, uh, uses sexuality as a metaphor to be able to talk about uh, people who are not faithful um, or someone who's out to get um, those who are faithful. Uh, so it, it, Jezebel ends up being um, used in Christian history uh, in a way that really accords with Revelation's reading of her. She's not uh, particularly um, depicted as a sexual, uh, sexually charged being um, in, in the book of 1 Kings. Uh, but she is actually in Second Kings, Second uh, Kings chapter nine. She's um, uh, respected, um, even if uh, hated in a way. So, uh, all to say, uh, she she depict she's depicted royally um, throughout the throughout the books of Kings. So, any event, uh, just to say that that people have been called Jezebels in American history um, for uh, to, to to pretty bad ends, I think, uh, and um, in very destructive ways. Um, uh, in order to uh, uh, minimize and, and marginalize uh, certain groups of people, especially African American women, uh, throughout throughout American history, so uh, we should be careful about how we use Jezebel or talk about Jezebel, uh, simply because uh, we should be aware of how that's that's how Jezebel has often been used. So, at any event, back to the ancient Near East, uh, Ahab tells Jezebel that Elijah what, what Elijah had done uh, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Remember, so this is how this this story starts by reminding us of that event, and then Jezebel sends a message to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also. Remember that, uh, that's oath language. She's swearing an oath. Um, so remember this this part uh, of the Bible is really interested in oaths and does a lot with oaths precisely because uh, this Elijah's message is that we have to be, uh, we have to have allegiance to Yahweh um, above and beyond all other things in this universe. So uh, all to say this, this is uh, uh, Jezebel is herself swearing an oath here, saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, and she's swearing by all her gods, of course, um, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So she swears to kill Elijah. Now Elijah did, like in 1 Kings 18, he seemed to have uh, limitless courage, right? Uh, he, he didn't have any hesitancy and so on. But this, for some reason, uh, Jezebel saying, well, I'm going to kill you by tomorrow. Um, that's enough to make him afraid, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, so in verse three right here, then he was uh, afraid. You can see right here. Um, and it's this Hebrew verb right here, uh, yara, which means like re really to, to be terrified. But it's also the phrase that's used to mean the fear of the Lord. Um, so as we said before, uh, th the fear of the Lord doesn't uh, quite mean like being like shaking in your boots, although it, it might mean that, but it really means more of a kind of like a sense of awe and wonder, um, uh, almost like you stand at the edge of a giant cliff and you get that kind of like awe and wonder and a bit of fear uh, all together. Um, or you like look at the stars and you think about how deep the universe is and it's sometimes even a little bit scary, that kind of fear. Um, but here he's afraid. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's, it's important to see he's like, he's afraid um, and ran for his life. Um, he's, he's afraid of Jezebel in ways that he wasn't afraid of Ahab or anybody else like that, which is, which is really um, odd. And 
some interpreters have pointed out uh, that uh, this the, the the mention this kind of strange mention of how he killed all the prophets with the sword at the beginning of chapter 19 it, it goes back a ways um, and the introduction of that as the thing that makes uh, Jezebel then uh, swear that she's going to kill Elijah uh, it, it might suggest that uh, Elijah realizes that his plan has failed um, that that he thought he had won that everyone was going to like I don't know come to his side or that Jezebel would give up and go home or something I mean he won he beat all the prophets of Baal killed them and uh, and the rain kept coming down but he kind of realizes that uh, he can't fix this, or he especially can't fix it by just killing all the bad people. Um, this is kind of an endemic problem, uh, and uh, th- th- he he doesn't really know what to do. Perhaps um, he is he is terrified not just of Jezebel. He runs for his life, but I mean he was he was you know should have been terrified for his life in chapter 18 and chapter 17 as well, right? He seemed fearless in those chapters. So something is happening here, and it doesn't seem to be Jezebel herself, like. That you know that she's more scary than Ahab. Ahab can kill people. Uh, so uh, it, it seems to be um, that this has to do with a kind of a realization about um, about what happened. Uh, and it, that 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 phrase he ran for his life suggests that he's maybe uh, a fearing and he's going to die. In Hebrew, it's he got up and he went actually to his nephesh to his cell for his breath and so on um it's like for the sake of maybe for the sake of his set sense of self he had to run away and leave um which might make more sense um overall that he's uh his understanding of what he was supposed to do his mission fell apart when when all everything didn't get fixed um you know we often have these things these things that like we think like oh i'm going to do this and when i'm done with that then it's going to be all be fixed right i just have to win this trophy i just have to get that job i just have to have this kid i just have to get married to that person i just have to i don't know get enough money and then finally i'll be great right and then of course that stuff happens or maybe it doesn't but let's say it does happen uh you get married you have the kids you have the job you know and then you realize well, I mean, those things are great, but um, they didn't solve all my problems. Um, my, my, I, I didn't enter into blessed eternity or something um, when, the, when all this stuff happened. Um, so Elijah may be fleeing in some way, uh, trying to figure out his life, trying to figure out his approach to the world. Um, and, and that might sound a little, I don't know, existential and like modern or something, but just just wait until we get into this because it gets even stranger. Um, I think this is, this is what we're going to have to end up with kind of some sort of um, an interpretation of this passage where it's really about Elijah's um, the failure of his way of thinking about the world or his um, his way of thinking about his leadership or his impact. Uh, the ultimate meaning of the story that we'll come back to at the end, I think, is something like um, you're not going to see the end that you want in this world. You're not going to see... Uh, everything happen, it all turn up roses, it all turn out the way that you want. Um, you're not going to accomplish all that you want to accomplish in this life, and that's actually a good thing, um, because that means that then you still have more life to live. There's still more to do, uh, and when we die, there'll still be more to do, um, and that's not a that's not a bad thing or a sad thing, that's actually a good thing. Uh, so all, all to say, that's, I think that, you know, Elijah thinks he, he's kind of finished his job, then he found, finds out that it's just as bad as it ever was, and that makes it, that gives him an existential crisis. I think this is an existential crisis. So then he ran for his life, and he came to Beersheba. Uh, Beersheba meaning seven wells. This is in the southern part of Israel, and he it's a, a, a fairly barren place outside of there. Seven, you got seven wells in a in a pretty dry place. Um, then that's pretty you're, you're doing pretty well. It's at the border of the Negev Desert, the desert in the southern part of Israel, and it's a. a you, you can't survive in the Negev just kind of out by yourself very easily unless you know exactly how to live in the wilderness. So it's a difficult space. It's a space that was um, understood you know, south of Beersheba in the Negev desert would have been assumed to be occupied by malevolent spirits, demon kind of things. Um, this is a, a, a strange and crazy place. Um, so he comes to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And it's interesting because remember he's a northern um, prophet. He spends most of his time in the northern kingdom uh, or even in Phoenicia, right? So, uh, but him coming to Judah is interesting, but he's got to go south of Judah even. He left his servant there. He, he didn't, you know, he, he, he uh, uh, didn't want a servant to go with him. He wanted to be fully alone out in the wilderness. We hear about this sometimes, Jesus being one person who kind of leaves everything behind and goes out in the wilderness in order to, in a way, um, confront their demons, right? Confront uh, uh, their failures and themselves and uh, their, their failed expectations about the world and about their own lives. Um, and those are often uh, pretty traumatic experiences and hard experiences. We see Elijah doing that exact same thing right here. Uh, so he goes a day's journey into the wilderness 
and that word wilderness here uh, that's a, a you know the absolute barren wilderness i mean deathly wilderness and he came and he sat down under a broom tree uh, these are some pretty incredible trees these are trees that, that sprout in the middle of nowhere uh, that you know so there's this uh, kind of almost symbolic aspect to them that they are holy in some way uh, that they're a symbol of god's ability to provide life in the middle of a harsh uh, a harsh area of, of, of death um, so think about that for a moment right that's that's kind of this power of God that we're seeing here, that Elijah's world has fallen apart, and yet in the middle of this wilderness that is symbolizing his own internal wilderness, there is miraculously this uh, this life that continues to exist, uh, that, that resiliently bursts through uh, uh, even when you least expect it. And he finds that space and he sits there, but instead of saying, wow, this is a reminder of God's presence in, in, in life, you know, often we're not in those spaces to recognize those things, um, to see those miracles and understand them for what they are when we're in a difficult space. So he sits under that broom tree and he says, uh, he asked that he might die. And he said, it's enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life for I'm no better than my fathers. That word fathers there, ancestors, no better than my ancestors. Um, he probably means the prophets who came before him, uh, but also Moses. You know, this, this, this story is very closely tied to the tradition of Moses. Um, you know, he's, go, he's gonna end up at Sinai. Uh, he's gonna end up doing pretty much what Moses did in Exodus 34, that is to see the glory of God, or at least he's going to ask to see the glory of God. If you remember that story in Exodus 34, it comes right after Exodus 32 and 33. Exodus 32 is the golden calf episode where Moses comes down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments in his hands, and he sees that Aaron and the people have decided to worship other gods in Moses' absence, and Moses gets mad and breaks the, the, the Ten Commandments, the, ta- the two tablets, right? Uh, and then ends up going back up to God and God says, well, should I start over with a different people? And Moses says, no, actually, let's let, let's try to work with these people. Um, and then uh, God uh, gives Moses a new Ten Commandments and then also shows Moses God, God's glory. I mean, God says, hey, Moses, says, can I see your glory? And God says, not, not really, you, you'll, you'll die. My power is too great. But what I'll do is I'll hide you in a cleft of a rock and I'll pass by and I'll call out uh, so that you know when I'm going by, you don't look, and I'll cover you with my divine hand, so that when I'm when I'm going by, you, you don't accidentally die from my overflowing power and glory. Uh, but then when I when I when I leave, my you can see my backside. Uh, you know, really the, the God's God's butt. I mean, that's that's literally the word that's used to to, to talk about this. But you know, Moses is able to look and see the backside of God um, as uh, as God is leaving and moving away, and that's that's almost too much still for a human to be able to survive and live. So Moses, in a really tough spot, asks to see God, and God shows up in the full divine glory, but provides Moses enough space to kind of survive in the midst of that. Um, This might be what Moses is thinking of. I mean, what Elijah is thinking of here. He's thinking of that story of Moses, and he wants to go to Sinai and find it. But we'll see that, not right now, but um, but he's here here in this point in verse 4, he's comparing himself to Moses, is saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not as good as they were. I mean, as if Moses solved all the problems of Israel, which he didn't, um, and Moses himself was a, was a failure in several ways, um, and God used him anyway, right? So uh, that is to say that, that Elijah may, may not um, have understood uh, the lessons of his ancestors, that no one, if you read the Bible and you find it a perfect hero, uh, you, you got to go back and read it again, at least, you know. Jesus is is one um, uh, that you could find, uh, but if you end up with like trying to find figure out that David's a perfect hero or Deborah or um, uh, or Elijah, I mean any of these uh, characters in the Bible, you, they're they're not there to be perfect heroes. They're, they've got all their problems too, which is why I kind of don't like the like the the hero. Um, you know, worship that you see sometimes in Bible studies where like, you know, everything David did was great. Well, that's not true. Uh, he did a lot of terrible things, in fact. Um, so, but but nevertheless, God works with people who have their problems like me and you uh, and like Elijah. But so Elijah here is comparing himself to these ancestors and saying, I better die because I, I didn't solve the problem. This is why I think that him murdering all the prophets of Baal and that not solving the problem is the problem. That's the core of his problem here. Um, uh, so then he, he thought, I guess he thinks, Moses killed all the bad people. I don't know, um, but uh, he's just forgetting that, right? It kind of, and you can you can see this in people's lives. I've seen this in my own life, where you kind of hit this like triumphant, um, you know, uh, pinnacle, and then and then like you just you just fall down from there. You know, you can hit some pretty low lows after that because you know if you think like. Uh, you know, getting rid of the prophets of Baal is going to solve the world's problems, and then it doesn't. Um, you know, after you after you get you do your mass, massive thing, and, and and everything looks great, and then all of a sudden it just starts to fall off the cliff. Um, you t- yourself can can be disappointed quite severely. So then he sleeps under this broom tree, and he's he's ready to die. 
But then it says, and behold, and I love this word. This is the Hebrew word hine here. Hine, and behold. Uh, and really it means like something's kind of coming in, like the, the narrator wants you to see from the character's eyes that something is surprising and coming into view. So check it out. An angel touched him and said, arise and eat. So the angel says, get up and eat. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, this is, you know, a divine messenger. The word here, uh, malach, meaning uh, divine messenger, uh, so it comes from God and said to rise and eat. This, 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 mal, this word malach can, can describe people just as much as divine beings, but probably a divine being here. Uh, but so, so he sp- God is providing him food and sustenance in the middle of the, the middle of the wilderness. Now notice that previously in chapter 17, right, the provision of sustenance in places that were uh, unexpected and, and were not places that you'd expect to provide food was really important. So he looks around and behold, there was a his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water and he ate and drank and lay down again so a good meal in the middle of the wilderness you ever been camping and you've been like eating cold food for a week and then you get a hot meal Oof, it's so good uh so he he gets this full sustenance right but it's still not enough he just he just lays right back down and he doesn't even say say uh you know thanks god <laughs> right um then the angel of the lord and this is a, a slightly different construction here. The, the the angel, the messenger of Yahweh, this is maybe a, a different being, uh, came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Uh, so this is a different thing. So it's not not just a meal here, but uh, you got to eat uh, because you're on a journey, telling him that he's on a journey. And it's really this word path, derech. Uh, the path is too great for you. Um, uh, so it's like too hard for you. You got you got to get some more more sustenance. So he eats and drinks, and then with the strength of that food, forty days and nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Pretty good food uh, here. You know, it's kind of angelic food like manna, right? So he's in the middle of the wilderness, which is near Sinai. This is the kind of the, the place of manna, right? So Exodus 16, God gives miraculous provision in the desert to the Israelites as they are traveling through, uh, as they are leaving bondage and trying to figure out a new life, right? And they themselves are disoriented and upset. It's a, it's a place where they, it's a time when they said, hey, should we, have, should we go back to Egypt? Um, uh, be, you know, can God possibly feed us here? Uh, so this is a bit like that manna, that miraculous food that appears in the wilderness. Uh, and with the strength of that food, it, dri- it drives him for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb. Now, I don't know if that, that, that time period sounds familiar to you, but you know, 40 days and 40 nights, kind of like Noah's flood, but also like Jesus, right? So Jesus is fleeing into the wilderness, the temptation in the wilderness. That, that that's referencing this, right? The, the amount of time that that took. The basic idea of that um, is this kind of time of uh, completion or something like that. But being in the wilderness for 40 days, um, we see here in uh, Elijah's story. And he goes to Horeb. Now, there's two names for Sinai. Sinai is the, one of the names. That's the name that's preferred uh, by the people who lived in Jerusalem. The people who lived in the northern kingdom of Israel, they used another name to refer to the mountain of God where, the, where Moses received the commandments, and that was Horeb. Um, we're not exactly sure why uh, they thought that, but uh, that they had two different names for it. Uh, but it's pretty clear that um, Horeb or Sinai and Sinai were not in the Sinai Peninsula. I'm sorry. I know I'm ruining it for you. Uh, the Sinai Peninsula is called the Sinai Peninsula because early Christians thought that's where Sinai was. They thought Sinai was there because of the Red Sea, um, but actually in Hebrew in Exodus uh, chapter 14, it's the Reed Sea, uh, like the Sea of Reeds. Um, it, it doesn't say the Red Sea. So you know, it, uh, we don't know exactly where that body of water was um, uh, in ancient times, but uh, it, it seems pretty clear from other biblical texts that ancient Israelites thought that Sinai and Horeb, this mountain of God, was actually uh, somewhere in what we would call the Transjordan area, somewhere in like where Edom was. Um, so southeast of Israel, in modern day Jordan, uh, there's a mountain called Mount Paran, probably near there, or it might even be Mount Paran. Uh, so I know that Christians have for a long time uh, held the, the monastery of uh, St. Catherine, which is at the foot of a mountain that's called uh, Jebel Musa in the Arabic tradition, uh, or Moses's mountain, um, that that is the place uh, of the revelation. Uh, but uh, the, the, let me show you a couple of things that uh, might might 
might change your opinion. Uh, one of those uh, one of those places uh, is Habakkuk chapter three, one of the least known uh, books in the Bible. Uh, it, it is one of the minor prophets. Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets uh, who um, uh, is one of the smaller books in the Bible, so a little manageable to, to be able to read. Uh, but if you turn and you find uh, the major prophets like Isaiah, kind of keep turning, and then if you get to Amos, you're getting into the minor prophets. If you see Jonah, you're nearby. Um, so if you keep turning after Jonah, you'll see Nahum, and then after Nahum, there's Habakkuk. So Habakkuk chapter three uh, is a, a pretty obscure biblical text, but I got a, a, a less obscure one. I just want to start here. Uh, but if you look at uh, Habakkuk chapter three, um, uh, you'll see uh, that there is kind of this poem about uh, about Yahweh working in ancient times. So Habakkuk is actually uh, a, a book from the Babylonian period. Uh, Habakkuk is kind of foreseeing the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, so he's talking about these kind of like ancient times, like I wish it was like ancient times. So uh, in verse two, O Lord, I have heard of your renown and I stand in awe, O Lord, of your work. In our own time, revive it. In our own time, make it known in wrath. May you remember mercy. So like, I, I wish it was like old times, God, that like we were so close to you and you were had your, your saving power showed up all the time. So then verse three, this is where it gets crazy. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. God comes from a place, Taman, which is Edom. Uh, and God comes from Mount Paran, which is a mountain in Edom. Uh, this is kind of a strange, strange thing to say um, that that God comes from there. That's God's home. That's where Habakkuk understands Sinai, or he doesn't use Sinai. He's Mount Paran. Um, but let me let me show you another place. This is a much more common uh, or well-known text, and this is uh, the Song of Deborah. So if we turn uh, to Judges, so uh, if you um, Turn to Judges chapter five. Judges chapter four is kind of the prose story of Deborah and Judges five is one of the most ancient pieces of Hebrew in the Bible, the Song of Deborah. We can see, um, I say that because of the way it's written. The It's written in this very obscure, um, archaic form of Hebrew. Uh, and also because uh, it only mentions 10 tribes. It doesn't mention Judah and it mentions tribes we've never heard of before. So it's a very interesting uh, text. But uh, okay, so uh, Deborah and Barak, chapter five, uh, Deborah is singing a song about the victory. Uh, and she says, uh, verse four, uh, Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled, the heavens poured, the clouds indeed poured waters, the mountains quaked before Yahweh, the one of Sinai, before Yahweh, the God of Israel. So Yahweh is the God of Israel, but has to be called. Like the whole point of this song is that like Yahweh was hanging out where in Yahweh's home, which happens to be in Edom or Seir, and that's equated with Sinai. And that is the house of God. And the God has to be called from that region to come up and help Israel. So there's a bad guy, Shamgar, verse six, right? And then like they have to call Yahweh and then Yahweh comes up and helps and then the other tribes some of them come and help some of them don't some of the tribes are excoriated for not helping here um, but just that really important part there that Yahweh is said to come from Edom uh, so Sinai is actually um, south of Beersheba uh, like where, like it says in in uh, 1 Kings 19 um, 1 Kings 19 does not describe Elijah going to uh, the middle of the Sinai Peninsula it, it seems to describe him going to this um, location in basically southeast of of, uh, of the Negev desert. Uh, so in any event, uh, why is this important? Why why would we care? The the location of uh, of Sinai is kind of uh, interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that um, Yahweh was understood as a commuter God in ancient Israel. Uh, Yahweh had to be called from a different country. Yahweh lived in Edom, but was the God of Israel. Um, it's also really interesting that every other God of every other people around Israel is said to have their own gods, like Milcom of the Ammonites, um, Molech uh, of uh, you know. So the, the, the peoples nearby have their own local deities. Baal is the deity of the Phoenicians, for example, of Tyre and Sidon. Um, but there's never a god mentioned for Edom, and the only like later on in history, there's writings of the Edomites, and they call their god Kos, and there are people named Kosayahu. Uh, Kos is Yahoo. Kos means the bow. So like Yahweh, the one who puts the bow in the clouds, like the rainbow from Genesis, uh, from the end of the Noah story, God puts the rainbow down. Um, that's like a pretty interesting thing about Yahweh. And 
So uh, it seems like the Edomites actually worshipped Yahweh. Um, they were they were cousins, kind of like you know Esau, and uh, they, they actually had the same God, uh, at least eventually. Uh, but so Israel has this wandering God who lives in the wilderness, um, who doesn't, at least at the beginning, live in the city in the main center of power. Uh, and Yahweh kind of overturns and upends um, places like Egypt. Uh, so this is this is I mean Elijah is a wandering guy who who lives in the middle of nowhere and is from nowhere uh, and is, you know, is kind of like this wilderness God. Um, and you can see that, that there are these kind of almost like two qualities of God that are in tension throughout the Bible. There's the, the God of Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the fortress. And this is a good thing in the Bible that Yahweh is the God of stability. Um, but also there's, there's always this other image of God that's intention. And that's like the God of movement and change. Um, the God of peoples who live in the wilderness areas, <clears throat> the God who unsettles, uh, the settled spaces. Um, and you can see this tension in like David's, uh, uh, let me, if you, if you have a Bible, second Samuel seven is a great place to see this tension at work. Um, uh, this is where Nathan is asking God uh, to, is it okay if David builds a temple for you? And that Yahweh apparently didn't have a temple before this. I mean, Yahweh lived in a tent, the tabernacle, and Yahweh actually liked living in the tent. And uh, David first comes to Nathan, the prophet, and says, can I build a temple? And Nathan says, oh yeah, sure. But then Nathan's like, wait, I should check with God. And then God says, no, <laughs> you're not supposed to build a temple. Um, and the reason, this is interesting, so verse 5, God says to Nathan the prophet, Go tell David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Whenever I moved about in the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word to any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why didn't you build me a house of cedar? Like, did I ever ask for a house? I've never asked for a house, God says. I don't want a house of cedar. I don't want a st stable house. I like my tent. I like moving around in the wilderness. I like being able to visit all the tribes of Israel. I like to talk to the tribal leaders. I mean, you see here this little resistance to the idea of a king even, the centralization of, uh, of authority. And you, in 1 Samuel chapters 8 through 10, God tells the prophet Samuel, I, I hate the idea of a king, right? So you see this kind of tension here, like, uh, that, that, that God loves the people and God also loves Jerusalem and God loves the temple even uh, throughout the Bible. But God is also resistant to the idea of making a temple. Um, uh, so then Yahweh says to David after that, uh, I, I don't want you to make me a house. I'll make you a house, uh, like the house of Tudor, like a divine, like a, you know, I mean, a, a, a dynastic house, right? Um, so just to say that this uh, tension we can see throughout the Bible, we can see here that uh, Elijah is really worried and concerned about the future of his life. He's in a moment of destabilization and uh, he doesn't go to a major shrine or something like that, to a major city, um, which he does in other places in, in, in the book. Uh, he, know, he knows where all the cities are with their, with their nice temples. But instead, he makes a long journey to go to the place where he knows that uh, it's possible to visit the wandering God, the God of destabilization, the God of, um, of rethinking order. Uh, so all to say, like all these kind of themes are are really buried throughout here. Uh, and you can think of the Mo Moses story as a story of like moving from complete disorder and disarray, like God destabilizing Egypt and breaking it apart so as to free the Hebrew slaves, but then also trying to build a new order after that uh, in the aftermath of it. Um, and you can think here of Elijah uh, trying to figure out where he fits in that narrative, I guess. So then Elijah comes to a cave and lodged in it. Uh, this is actually the word for lodge, like, you know, set up a little camp like he's camping in this in this big cave uh this the cave is important because it's a cleft of the rock in exodus chapter 34 that yahweh stashes moses in so that moses can see god's glory and like i said i think that's a really important part of the story too because uh, it's all about um uh, idolatry right so moses comes down off the mountain after receiving the ten commandments and god gets and, and he gets really mad at, at aaron and the people for worshiping the golden calf an um, act of idolatry and he breaks the ten commandments the the relationship's been broken and then he, uh, uh, it goes back up in the mountain to just discuss the future of the people with God. Uh, and, and, and he pleads 
for the continuation of the people. And it's God who says, maybe we should start over with a different group of folks, or I'll start over just with you, Moses, um, you and your family, just you and your family, immediate family, and, and then I'll, I'll make a new people kind of like with, with Abram. And Moses said, no, it's not going to work because, you know, you started with Abram. I mean, you start with me, it's just going to fall apart again too. But also the other nations will be confused about why'd you, why'd you abandon your people, right? You're not a God who abandons people. So then God says, okay, great. Uh, and then and then it commits to, to working with the people again. Uh, so in, in the midst of that story of idolatry, abandonment, um, of failure, uh, and uh, frustration, uh, frustration about call. Moses is unsure about being their leader at that point in time. What, what, what can I do to help these people? And so on. Uh, you can see all that uh, at play here when Moses comes to, uh, Elijah comes to this cave that is associated with Moses. And there's some suggestions like this is supposed to be the cave. You know, this is supposed to be the same cave that Moses was in or something like he found the actual cave. Um, so behold, uh, and then this is that word he named again. Behold, check it out. The word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, just think about this for a second. So he makes this 40 day trek. He's been like support, supported and sustained by divine food. He's pretty sure he's supposed to be here. But the question is, what are you doing here? This reminds me of the questions in the garden where God's like, where are you, right? I mean, you know, the asking, God's asking questions that God knows the answer to, right? What are you doing here, Elijah? Uh, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Uh, and this is hopefully supposed to be like prompt some deep introspection and reflection and so on. Uh, by the way, the exact phrase here is, uh, what to you is here, Elijah? Um, what to you is here. Do you remember in the New Testament when like uh, uh, Jesus says, like, what, what do you have with me, woman, when he talks to his mom really strangely, uh, talks to Mary at, at the uh, Feast of Cana, the wedding Feast of Cana, and he turns the water into wine. He's like, what, 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 what is there between you and me, woman, whatever. This is that same, the same kind of phrase. It's like an ancient Hebrew expression. And really it's like, um, what do you want here? What, what do you want here, Elijah? Um, when you're asked what you want, that's always a really hard thing to actually answer, right? Um, so uh, it, when it's not like, I want pizza or something, you know, if it's, what do you really want in life? Um, what do you really want? Uh, Elijah got what he wanted, uh, the death of the prophets of Baal, and it turned out to be a false hope. So he said, Elijah's response, now you'd hope Elijah would do some great soul searching here or something. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord. And this word jealous or zealous uh, I have been jealous or zealous. This is um, a word that's used to describe Yahweh, right? To describe God. I'm a jealous God. Um, this is not supposed to be a negative thing. It's supposed to be kind of, I don't know, almost funny. Like, but so in the ancient world, right, um, anyone could worship any God. Um, certain gods were tied to certain places and so on, but any person could offer worshiping, you could worship any god. Uh, and uh, gods weren't jealous. Like if you offered uh, sacrifices to Ale and to Baal and to Asherah, all the Canaanite deities, they would all be like, great. There's no competition between them for like how, you know, for as long as you're sacrificing to like your local God, you can sacrifice to other gods too. Great. Um, you're supposed to, in fact, kind of support the many gods. Uh, so the idea of a jealous God, a God who only wants one people and, I mean, you know, it's open borders in that, in that group of people. It's, it's uh, like I've said many times in, in our classes, um, ancient Israel was not a biological society. There are people from all over the ancient Near East who could join this group of people, which was actually unusual. Uh, but so it was, it was a mishmash of people from all over, but it was a covenant community. If you join the covenant, you join the community. And that covenant is a marriage. It's understood to be a marriage between the people and Yahweh. Uh, and it requires faithfulness, fidelity, um, loyalty, uh, like a marriage would. Uh, so this idea of God being jealous or zealous, you know, this, uh, you know, the God is um, demanding loyalty from the people and God uh, so, so Elijah's like, I've been loyal to you. I did. I gave you that loyalty thing, that, that thing that's really important to you. I've been very jealous. And it, the way it is said exactly in the Hebrew is, and he said, to be jealous, I have been jealous. <laughs> so it's this uh, ancient Hebrew idiom, uh, idiom uh, to say, um, uh, I, you know, I've been super jealous. Uh, I, I've been, I've been really, really loyal to the Lord, the God of hosts. And the way he says that, uh, Yahweh, uh, Elohei Sabaot, the God of hosts, the God of the divine armies suggesting that God is a God of vengeance and war and bloodshed. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. That word azav is uh, to abandon. This is that word that Jesus says from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me or abandoned me? Um, so uh, the people of Israel have forsaken or abandoned your covenant. 
They've thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Now, I don't want to minimize Elijah's uh, problems. Um, he's living in a difficult time and he is doing a difficult work. But notice his response to God saying, what are you doing here? What do you want? And he moans about the fact that he's the only one who's doing anything good and he's done everything perfect. I, you know, this this is I, I think uh, First Kings nineteen is not a story um, of like Elijah being a good guy. This is a story about Elijah um, failing in many ways, um, and it's not a failure to say to say your problems. Some people have interpreted this that like Elijah gets depressed and then God gets mad at him for being depressed. This is not the case. Um, Elijah uh, is, is, uh, depression and um, this are are slightly different. Uh, this is this is a bit uh, narcissistic, right? Uh, the the entire earth depends upon me to save it, and I have done everything perfect. And the it's these losers that I'm surrounded by that um, that haven't done the right thing. Um, this is not like clinical depression kind of talk. I don't think um, this is uh, more so uh, a, bit, a bit of narcissism. So uh, he says. Uh, uh, I've done all the right stuff and all the people are terrible and I only I am left. I'm the only one left. And this is a problem because we know, in fact, that he's not the only one left. In fact, we know that he knows he's not the only one left because remember his friend Obadiah who works for Ahab, Obadiah told him that there were other prophets who were left, hundreds of other prophets left, right? Uh, that he had hid in the caves and fed and so on. Uh, so uh, God knows this, right? Why is Elijah overstating what he knows and what's happening here? Um, unless he's trying to kind of get God's sympathy or something? I don't know. So so then God's response to Elijah moaning about his situation, but also setting himself up as the hero in his own narrative and everyone else is the villain. He says, go out and stand on the mountain before Yahweh. And behold, Yahweh passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before Yahweh, but Yahweh was not in the wind. Okay, so this is referring exactly to the uh, story of Moses and um, uh, in, in Exodus 34, right, the, the, the mountain um, when God appeared and went by. So if you haven't ever read that story, just check it out in Exodus 34. Just pause the video. Just just read it. It takes five minutes and less. And, um, and you'll ne then come back and you'll see this. So behold, the Lord passed by. So go out and stand in the mountain before the Lord. And behold, behold the Lord passed by. So this idea that God's presence, you want, you want to see God, here's God. God passed by in a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. So this is like the glory of God, right? And it's using that word, uh, the great and strong wind. That's the word ruach, which means spirit. So you know, the spirit, the wind of the Lord, God's presence is there, just tearing everything up, right? Uh, when God shows up in the Bible, often it's called a theophany. Uh, often this is associated with uh, destruction and things being kind of torn to shreds. Uh, and it's it's not because God hates the mountain or something or is punishing the mountain. Uh, it's just that this is what happens when God's power enters the world. God is so powerful that God's entry into the world God's presence shakes things up. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And I think that's supposed to be interesting for us because all this powerful stuff, that's, and we're told that the Lord goes by, but you, Elijah didn't, it's not said that Elijah sees any of this. What Elijah sees is this like huge destruction happening, but God wasn't in that wind and God wasn't in that earthquake. Wait, what? Where's God then? God's just not there. And then verse 12, after the earthquake, there was a fire. So these are things that are associated with God's presence, but God was not in the fire. This is like, uh, this is supposed to be um, very confusing. The, the, the thing that's supposed to happen is that there was a fire and God was in the fire, right? Deuteronomy 4 says God's like like fire, you know, at the top of Mount Sinai, there's explosions and thunder happening when Yahweh shows up to the Israelites and Yahweh's in the fire. Um, that's where Yahweh, that's, you can tell where Yahweh is because that's where the fire is. But there's all this destruct, natural destruction happening, which would be a sign of God's presence, but God's not in all that flashy stuff. And then it says, and after the fire, there was the sound, and this translation says, of a low whisper. I've not found a translation that's done a great job so far of translating this. Um, but so after after the fire, 
after the fire, coal, which means a sound or a voice or can mean the thunder. And if this is the word that's used like for God's voice from Sinai. When, when Yahweh spoke to the Israelites, it was with this coal of this voice. So here's a voice. Yahweh spoke, and, you know, so, and after the fire, there was this voice of damama daka. Damama doesn't really mean whisper. It says that here, but it means like, uh, if I was to translate this, it would be um, silence. Damama really kind of means silence. No no sound, actually. And then daka means thin or crushed, crushed up. A thin, crushed silence. The sound, like the voice of a thin, crushed silence was there. So like we heard this, we, it's often translated as a still small voice. Um, but still and small, and I, like that does that's not doing justice. I don't think to the Hebrew here. Uh, it, there, there's a nothing. There's a void. There's there's a crushing silence. And when Elijah heard this crushing silence, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. He's like, where is you know? Because he's supposed to be hiding in the cave because God's presence is too powerful to be. There. But he's like, he's covering his face in his cloak just just in case we can duck his eyes under. Uh, just like uh, uh, when you go into the temple, if you go in the holy of holies, only the high priest can do that. You're supposed to fill it up with smoke, so it's like so smoky you can't see anything in there. So Elijah's like, I don't want to die, but I want to see what like the, is God even out there? Where, where is God? Right? And he stood at the entrance of the cave, and behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? The exact same thing that God asked just a couple verses earlier before that massive explosion of presence. Now remember what brought Elijah here was that there was this massive explosion of God's presence and it didn't solve all of Elijah's problems. And now Elijah has just seen this massive explosion of God's presence and he hears the same question. What are you doing here? What do you want here? What do you want me to do for you? And listen to what Elijah says. I've been very jealous of the, for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. He says the exact same thing that he said a couple of verses earlier. He, he didn't learn anything. It seems to me that this uh, the, the God's uh, sending all these explosions, but God's not in the explosions. God isn't even said to be in the still small voice. Notice that. Like there was just, after a while, there was a low, this kind of crushing silence. I think some of the, the idea is that God is not primarily to be found in miraculous events. Um, God is often be, to be found in the silences in our lives, um, in the disruptions, in the things that we, in, the, in our failures, in the things that we don't understand. Um, God is is uh, is not simply a God of massive victories. Um, uh, and and if you're not having the massive victories, you're you're not enjoying God or not pleasing God or something. I think that's a very dangerous way to think about the world, but it's a way that we are always tempted to uh, with religion. Uh, so then, um, uh, he, you know, he, and he said, I'm, I'm the only one left and they're going to try to kill me. So he says the exact same thing. So what does God say to him this time? The, the, the display of the mountains and thunder and, and, uh, uh, and the wind and the crushing wind didn't work. Uh, so God tries another thing. God says, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. You're going to make a different Syrian king. Uh, okay. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elipha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Mehulah, you shall anoint to be prophet in, in your place. There's a change in leadership that's going to happen, including Elijah. In your place. Somebody else is going to be king in your place. And that's the Hebrew word, tachatecha, um, uh, under you. Or it, it really is about, like, it's a word that you'd use for like usurpation, but also for someone who like succeeds you on the throne if you're a king. So there's going to be a new prophet, new prophet in town. This is in a way a decommissioning of Elijah. Elijah's still got work to do. We'll see in chapter 21. He's got some great things to do. But all the same, uh, God has begun to move to the next prophet. The reason I think that God does this is that if Elijah thinks that everything revolves on him and everything relies on him and he's going to be the end of the story, He's going to do the thing that's going to destroy the need to have prophets anymore. Uh, he's going to, the only thing that's going to take that away from him is realizing that there's someone who's going to come after him, who's going to continue his work when he's gone. And so for the rest of the time that he's here, while he's working on his work, uh, then he can realize that um, the point of the work isn't to extinguish the need for the work, uh, that his goal 
after which he'll just have fun and enjoy things um, is not to complete uh, this work and make everyone love Yahweh perfectly and kill all the bad people. But instead, uh, working in the midst of an imperfect world uh, is in fact the reason we get up every morning and what gives us reason to live. Uh, if we fixed everything and solved everything and there was nothing more to learn or do or struggle with, um, it'd be pretty hard for us to want to get up and face the day. We in part, uh, it's hard to face the day when there's too many problems too, right? Uh, but uh, finding that balance um, of motivation and desire and passion, but also things that aren't yet done in the world um, is a, a sweet spot. And that's true for the mission uh, that we have uh, that, that God has given us too. So anyway, there's more to say about uh, about chapter 19, especially Elijah going and finding Elisha, casting his cloak upon him and so on. But this is the point that, uh, the part of the story that I wanted to focus on. Uh, next time, and we'll, we'll talk about Elisha a lot more uh, later on in the class. Uh, but, but next week, um, uh, we'll move on and talk about uh, Elijah and uh, the vineyard of Nebot, where Elijah returns to being at least somewhat a hero. All right, uh, best wishes for you all this week, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll hope to return and see you all in person sometime soon. Um, and uh, may God bless you and keep you and preserve you until we meet again.